Good evening, everyone. My name is Ants. I am one of the F1 doctors working on the team at Mind the Bleep. Uh, today, I'm going to be giving your lecture on breast surgery. Um, just before we start, though, um, just got a small note from the from the BMA. We've got Dan here has joined us. I want to tell you a little bit about the BMA, which I'm sure a lot of you will be, will be getting involved with once you qualify and, and start working next year. Perfect. Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, I, I will literally talk for a couple of minutes before you, you guys get going. Um, it's obviously a very important time uh, for the BMA and for you guys as, as a whole. Um, juniors, I mean, consultants, SaaS doctors as well. Um, so, yeah, with the pay campaign, we're, we're into a new year now. So this is technically the third calendar year. This has been rumbling on for, uh, for juniors. Um, so, yeah, just an important time to, to be members, especially with you guys um, becoming F1s you know it'll, it'll come very soon um so yeah it, <coughs> just something to think about um for those watching live and also anyone watching this um uh recorded um yeah if you, if you wanted to join you get a bit of a benefit of joining using this link that's on the screen um you get a 10 pound amazon voucher so it basically equals out um free your first three months of membership um so yeah take advantage of it um just use that qr code and then i know it's a bit fidgety but drop me an email after you've joined um and, and i'll get an amazon voucher sent out to you um yeah simple as that really if you go online there's nothing there's no really incentive to join we don't really do incentives that often but yeah so this is like a little secret thing for you guys so yeah join get time on an amazon voucher um yeah cover cover membership for about three months so it's like three months free so it's three pounds 75 a month um for, for final years and that rolls through like a little bit into into f1 um, so yeah, just a little bit about the BMA. I mean, I, I, I guess everyone knows what we do uh, these days. It's, it's so sort of sort of everywhere and 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 very much in the news. So you can't really um, confuse us anymore. We used to get a lot of confusion with um, what indemnity do. So people come up to me and say, "Oh, I'm part of the MDU. Is that the same thing?" Um, so no, BMA is is your union. So it's your trade union professional association. So you can be a member um, right now and, and sort of reap the benefits right now. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get onto it, but but it's very important for, for what's going on at the moment um, in terms of the fact that if, if there is a, a pay offer that's, that's put out by the government, I mean, it's, it's, the negotiations have been um, not been great so far, but but pretty adamant this this year, um, things all sort of get sorted. I mean, it's been going on for so long. Um, anyway, if there's a if there's a pay offer that comes out. Anyone who's a member in their final year uh, and upwards will get to vote on that. So yeah, it's it's very important that, that you guys join um, and have your say because this affects your pay for the next you know, fifteen twenty years or so. Um, not to mention the con the consultant stuff, but but the consultant's vote is going on right now. Um, so yeah, so we're the trade union for for doctors and med students in the UK. So not just doctors, but med students. Um, and it's important knowing that we are only for doctors and, and med students. So. Um, Obviously, there's RCN for nurses. BMA is purely purely for for doctors and med students. Um, and yeah, you can see there's 191,000 members um, that we've got at the moment. So most of the most of the uh, most of the most of doctors and, and med students are members. Um, so yeah, we're we're very strong, and that's why we're able to to, <coughs> to be doing what we're doing right now and fighting for um, pay. So yeah, uh, touched on this already. I mean, I won't go into m massive detail on this because I'm sure everyone knows what's going on and everyone's aware of, of the strikes going on at the moment. Um, juniors have just had um, a bit of a break over Christmas, let's say. We've we've, we've had the biggest uh, strike in, in NHS history just come to an end the other day. Um, and yeah, like I said, uh, it's important for you guys to be involved as of now. You can be members now and you can get the benefits other than obviously the union, the union side of things, which I'll go on to. But yeah, it's just important that you guys show show sort of strong force coming in as the new f ones um and yeah you'll have a say on it and any of us that put out so yeah a few of the other things that might that might help um in terms of being a bma member i'm sure you guys all know about the bma library um it's all sort of moved completely virtual now but every single book textbook you could possibly need um is 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 on is online on our bma.org.uk forward slash library forward slash library um uh you can access any book you could possibly need um instantly um so yeah check it out if you're already a member or, or everything you're joining bmj learning as well you've got full access to that you may get access to bmj learning through your med school but um this 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 version of bmj learning is the complete version so no paywalls or anything like that um you've got lots of revision tools on there <laughs> lots of online modules so yeah make the most of that clinical key don't know if you guys have ever used clinical key 
um, essentially a point of care tool. So you can download the app, log in through your with your BMA login, um, and it will, <laughs> it will give you all sorts of um, sort of point of care videos and, and um, guidance. And uh, you know, you type in any condition, it will bring up every single thing uh, related to that textbooks, journals um, you could you could ever think of. So an another great tool. Um, as final year students, uh, not a lot of people know this, but you're entitled to the, the BMJ, so the full doctor's version. So the subscription to that is included as being a final year um, member. So you get one BMJ through the post a week. So, I mean, even if you just divided the £3.75 between the four um, BMJs you get through the post every week, that's less than a pound uh, delivered to your door even if that's the only thing you you, you use or, or read. Um, so yeah, if you are already a member, just give us a call on that on our general number and say, yep, I'm in final year. I just want to opt in to get the BMJ. It is an opt-in thing. So if you know, you know, um, we don't just start sending it out just in case sort of addresses aren't necessarily up to date. So yeah, do do opt-in if you're already a member and you want that. So just give us, give us a call anytime. Um, we've got a great um, wellbeing support service, um, completely... Um, unique of anything of anything else that I know of, to be honest, um, because it has a, a peer support doctor service. So if you phone up, you can either speak to a counselor or a peer support doctor. So, so someone who's been through um, similar situations to, to to what you may have experienced. Um, and obviously, if you've thrown this more than once, um, <coughs> we'll try and make sure that you speak to the same person again. This is completely um, free to everyone. So regardless of if, whether you're a member or not, um, it's there for everyone to use. Specialty Explorer may be a bit early to be thinking about your uh, specialty, but this is a really good tool to sort of use now and maybe maybe um, sort of F1 and just every every six months or so take take this um, psychometric test. It takes about 20 minutes to complete um, and ask lots of work life balance questions. And then at the end, it will break down um, all the top suited specialties according to the answers you've given um, and always throws up sort of a lot of things that you, you might not expect. Um, yeah, breaks breaks down why why certain specialties would be great for you. Um, series of graphs and charts if, if you're into that kind of thing. Um, it's really detailed in, in its reasoning. Cool, that's it. Thank you for listening to to my to my talk. Like I said, if you're not already a member, this this year is going to be a pivotal year um, in terms of. I mean, your your pay for the for the for a big chunk of your career. So yeah, do get involved. Um, do have your say when when things. Um, start to materialize um, and yeah get, get an Amazon voucher for joining today £3.75 a month is, is all it costs um, so it's sort of like balancing out the first three months and obviously you're free to to leave any time as well that's it um, try to be as quick as possible thank you for having me um, and I'll let you get on with the session thank you so much just be sharing my slides there we go, we're good. so yeah Good evening, everyone. Just see Daniel's posted uh, posted the link into the chat if you wanted to access uh, the Amazon voucher that he shared to signing up. So yeah, as I mentioned, we're covering breast surgery today. Breast is quite a nice succinct topic, I think, for your uh, for your finals. Um, taking a look at the UK UK MLA content map. You've only got a handful of conditions and presentations you need to be aware of. And I think really this boils down into to breast cancer uh, and then benign breast disease that, that presents. Um, it's it's quite nice. I think there's not a huge amount of detail that's, that's really expected at your level as an undergraduate. Um, but I think it's being aware of common concerning features as well as managing um, and appropriately managing breast cancer, I'd say. So we'll start with an SBA. I'm just going to share the poll. Okay. So a 47 year old female is referred to the one stop breast clinic by her GP. Following the discovery of a lump, which of the following will be the most, will be most likely undertaken? Just give you a little longer to get your responses in. We've got a bit of a split at the moment.
Oh, okay, yeah. We're chopping and changing a little bit. Okay, so the answer was actually breast examination, mammogram, and then fine needle biopsy. So just about most of you put this one, but there was a little bit of a split, so we'll talk through it. Um, so in the one-stop breast clinic, I guess the best way you could uh, think about it is you want three forms of evidence to reassure you that you're not dealing with breast cancer. Clinical examination, imaging, so radio radiographic evidence, and then pathological evidence, so a biopsy specimen sample. Um, examination was a feature in all the answers, so we don't need to worry about that. Why mammogram as opposed to ultrasound in this case? Um, ultrasound's not a wrong answer, so to speak, necessarily. Um, the reason why mammogram is more important is because as we get older, our breast tissue becomes less dense. So on a, on a mammogram, um, the lumps or, or inappropriate lesions are better visualized in less dense breasts. Ultrasounds are more useful in younger women, um, but unfortunately, if you were to do a mammogram in a very young woman with very dense breasts, you'd almost get a whiteout picture. I've got a slide, uh, a couple slides along that will show you, show you that. Um, so typically, this age range can sometimes be denoted as over the age of 40. I've known other centers might use um, different age cutoffs, um, but generally speaking, around the age of 40 or so, you probably opt for mammogram as opposed to, to ultrasounding. The final component was uh, the specimen taken. Um, so different types of um, biopsies are undertaken uh, at the one stop clinic. Um, the final bi bi biopsy is just using a needle and aspirating really the, the lump. This is something that can be done on the day in the clinic um, if, it, if deemed appropriate. Core biopsies are also done, uh, although the correct answer didn't feature a core biopsy in this case. Um, Core biopsies require the use of an ultrasound. They're a little bit more invasive. Um, it probably uh, wouldn't be as accessible um, as doing the final biopsy. It takes a little bit more time. Um, excisional biopsies are was the red herring here. There's no real role for excisional biopsy um, in obtaining specimens for breast cancer. cancer. Uh, excisional biopsies, more so in the case that you could think of when you were, say, removing a suspicious skin lesion. Um, So here I've got a collection of images and mammograms, and you can see as the breast gets, gets more dense, as you see in younger women, you get a white out and it's not very easy to make out much. Um, so often this can mask the appearance of lumps uh, or other suspicious lesions. Okay, yeah, so the first topic we're going to talk about is breast cancer, which really is the bulk of, of, of what we're working with in our in our breast discipline. The triple assessment is the is the mainstay of assessing the breast lump, like we talked about. It's the two week weight cancer pathway. Um, I've included a resource at the end, which I suggest taking a look at for your two week weight pathways. I think it's um, really helpful. It's the guide that Macmillan produces. It's what I use to learn my pathways for my exams. It's very succinct. All the information's in one place, and I think it's quite easy to di digest, and they update it regularly as well. So I definitely recommend taking a look at that. I'll, I'll pop a link for that in the chat later. Um, and yeah, I think it's it's important to remember that most lumps won't be cancer, um, but still, it's important to thoroughly assess them and reassure them because it's it's quite a frightening experience um, for those of you that attended breast clinic or, or the one stop clinic, is often called. People come in very very nervous, very anxious. Um, but most lumps aren't, aren't cancer. The triple assessment, like we talked about, examination, radiographic imaging, and then follow your specimen. As you're progressing throughout this assessment, we're creating essentially a risk score for each stage. So the examination, the imaging, and the histology um, from, the, from the sample that we collect. And we're grading the, the likelihood that this, this lump is, is malignant. Um, and as people progress either, then we can reassure them, actually, you know, there's, you know, examination findings are normal, had a look in imaging that isn't a suspicious lump, uh, people can be reassured and sent home, or if cases are suspicious and we take a sample, then all this information is collated uh, and an MDT discussion is, is later had about all, every case that is, uh, is, is concerning. Um, and from there, then you can generate 
management options, which could be operative and also involve non-operative adjunct therapy as well. The other main um, way by uh, which women may interact with the breast service um, regarding breast cancer would be through screening. So if they haven't come presenting with a lump, it could be that they've come for their regular check uh, and perhaps something suspicious is found then. So at present, women aged 50 to 70 um, are invited to screening. The asterisk is because for past several years, actually, there's been um, a clinical trial run by Oxford University called the AJEX trial. And basically what this is looking at is whether offering an additional screening opportunity, uh, once between the age of 47 to, to, to 50, and then another one from 70 to 73. So essentially an extra one either side of the current window um, reduces um, uh, risk of harm caused by, by breast cancer if um, breast cancer is picked up easier and sooner uh, and if outcomes are better. Um, so at present, as per the NICE guidelines, it's 50 to 70, but I imagine that uh, this could could change in the future. So that's why I put the asterisks, so you're aware. Um, women over, over 70 can still self-refer themselves for screening. It's just that they're not given the invite letters in the post as they would have been previously. Um, and I think this could very reasonably be something you'd have to counsel somebody on um, in a simulated or even in a real life scenario. So I think it's important to have some degree of awareness what, what happens. Um, women have mammograms when they come in for these for these checks. That's the the way the the um, the appointment works. I don't know if any of you have ever seen a mammogram, but if you had to explain it to someone, I think it's worth noting that the process can be a bit undignified uh, or feel undignified to patients and can be a little bit uncomfortable. Um, normally, they take two views of the breasts. And I think the picture on the right is from Cancer Research. I think it, it demonstrates it quite well, actually, what, what they do. Um, a woman essentially has to have her breast comp compressed between uh, two plates. Um, and they try and get the breast as flat as possible to get the best image of the best breast as possible. They take two views, one from the top and then one sort of from the side. Um, and a caveat to that might be you may need more views if breast implants um, are present um, just to make sure that they're not uh, obscuring your view of, of a suspicious looking lesion. From this, women may be reassured there's nothing of concern and they'll return to their normal three hourly, uh, three hourly, sorry, three yearly um, follow up. Um, or there may be some concern and then further imaging or further tests are required, um, which would be taking a, a pathological uh, sample. Of course, if the results are inconclusive, then you re repeat the investigation. Okay, so we've got another question. Um, I'm just going to put the poll up. This is probably just one you either know or you don't. got a split so far. Okay, let's get to the answer. So the answer is induct invasive ductal carcinoma. Um, so the reason I included this is I felt that it's often important to know which things are common because common things are common and I think if you're uncertain having some gauge of um, incidence of disease can help make you allow you to make a more educated guess um, when you're faced with these type of questions. So invasive ductal carcinoma is the most common type of breast ca cancer, um, invasive globular ca carcinoma is the second most common type and then ductal carcinoma in situ is the most common type of non-invasive breast cancer. The other two are actually very rare types of ca cancer um, so I think if faced with a presentation in, a, in an SBA or uh, a question, um, it would be uh, unlikely to be one of those, those two.
Next, SBA. So a patient is being counseled ahead of her mastectomy with auxiliary clearance. Which of these is not a recognized complication of the procedure? Yeah, you've done you've done very well on this one. Nearly everyone got this one right. So yeah, so the answer is hypermobility in the ipsilateral shoulder. So just to run through them, winging of the scapula, that's due to long thoracic nerve injury. So the long thoracic nerve um, can be damaged uh, in a mastectomy. And it's one of the responsibilities of the long thoracic nerve uh, is innervating the serratus anterior, which is responsible for keeping the scapula tucked in against the thoracic wall. Um, so winging of the scapula is definitely a complication that's possible. Numbness in the armpit, so the intercostobrachial nerve can be separated in the procedure. Um, and unfortunately, that just results in paresthesia in, in the armpit. Um, so it's a known complication. Lymphedema in the arm on the ipsilateral side, um, again, is very much possible. Auxiliary node clearance, I think is almost self-explanatory that removal of the auxiliary nodes um, impairs lymphatic, clearage, lymphatic fluid clearage, clearance, uh, and as a result, um, you can develop lymphedema. Um, seromas are, are common, but actually uh, often do resolve post-operatively. Um, and what you're more so likely to get is uh, stiffness and uh, immobility in the arm um, following um, following surgery uh, due to the long period of immobilization. Um, so this may re may require some degree of physiotherapy uh, to get people back mobilizing as, as per normal. So yeah, I think it was just worth men mentioning and, and um, flushing over some of the gross anatomy, um, just so the, the cancer terminology makes sense to you. Um, we talked a little bit about um, the ducts uh, and ductal carcinoma in situ and invasive ductal carcinoma. Um, and I think it's just worth noting um, the lobules and um, the ducts within the breast uh, and having an understanding of, of disease progression from, from DCIS to invasive disease. Okay, so next SBA. So a 55-year-old female has diffuse lesions in her upper inner quadrant and upper outer quadrant of her left breast. What would be the most appropriate intervention? I'll just put the poll up. Okay, so we've got a, a mixed split so far. But yeah, a good chunk of you did really well on that one. 
So the right answer uh, I've got down here is left mastectomy plus sentinel node biopsy and then post-operative radiotherapy. So we'll go through it. So I think we can rule out um, bilateral mastectomy because there's no indication for, for bilateral um, mastectomy. Bilateral mastectomy uh, is performed actually prophylactically in some, some ladies. And I think it was popular, popularized um, by Angela Jolie, Jolie um, perhaps about a decade ago now, because she had prophylactic uh, bilateral mastectomy. Um, but it's really um, indicated in actually people that have um, known and diagnosed um, mutations associated with the disease. I won't talk too much into this because it's going to come up a little bit later. Um, but there are very specific indications, I think, that would warrant a bi bilateral mastectomy. Um, and the disease here is confined to the left breast, so we have no concerns about the bre right breast from the, from the vignette attached. Left wide local excision would not be appropriate in this case because she has diffuse lesions. So I think um, a concept worth getting to grips with is the fact that breast conserving surgery, so wide local excision, um, really is more, more appropriate when we have a, uh, a small localized tumor which is small relative to the, to the breast itself. I think that puts a new position where um, you can perform a wide local excision uh, and conserve the breast um, and have enough tissue uh, to conserve the breast, you know, left behind. Um, in this case, this lady has diffuse lesions, so it's unlikely that wide local exc excision would be possible or feasible. Um, she's got essentially different small pockets of, of, of cancer in the breast. Um, probably her breast would only be amenable to, to an entire mastectomy, so removal of all that breast tissue. There are um, really quite um, a lot of you know weird and wonderful things they can do, actually. Um, of course, there's breast reconstruction using implants, but actually even using your own, your own tissue. Um, if you're so interested, you, you could have a read up about TRAM uh, and DEAP FLEPS. Um, flap, sorry, but there's um, there's lots of that can be done in the way of reconstruction, um, and there's nipple sparing reconstruction, and and lots of op actually options from an oncoplastic point of view, but um, they definitely aren't really in the scope of of what you need to know for for your finals. The last option was um, why did we not include auxiliary node clearance? Um, so it's essentially, auxiliary node clearance, as we talked about earlier, is not only is it um, significantly increasing the operative burden physiologically on the patient, um, but also there's the real complications of side effects. So you've got lymphedema, which is quite pronounced, and that could become quite disabling for the patient. So in order to try and prevent that uh, and minimize, I guess, the, the um, impact on the patient, it's worth assessing the spread um, of the cancer in the lymphatic system and trying to be as conservative as possible. So what they do in a, in a sentinel bi node biopsy, which I think is really clever actually, um, they use this um, gamma emitting radioisotope. Uh, and what they do is they inject it. It's this dye that they inject into the lymphatic system, the auxiliary lymphatic system. Uh, and the auxiliary lymphatic system is uh, sequential. So the nodes all follow from one to another. Um, and this, this dye essentially um, is used, uh, and a gamma probe is used to look for, for radioactive nodes. Um, so they work their way down the lymph nodes. Um, and all of the ones that flag up uh, as being radioactive and showing you know, signs of, of malignancy are then can be removed appropriately. Um, and those that are not uh, are left behind. And what this does is I think this minimizes uh, unnecessary surgery and I think preserves the, the patient's uh, lymphatic system as best possible. Um, so that's why it'd be inappropriate to, to jump straight ahead to auxiliary node clearance. Um, okay, sure. So we have uh, an OSCE scenario. Um, a 45-year-old female presents your surgery with complaints of a new breast lump. What questions will you ask as part of the focus history? If you could pop into the chat any questions that you would like to ask uh, this patient if she came to the GP surgery.
Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree. Yeah, we were talking about m malignancy, of course. Yeah, mastectomy would be very, very radical um, for a benign breast condition. You're absolutely right. So, how's it going over time? Very good. Is it painful? Excellent. Whereabouts in place? Skin changes. Skin changes. Very good. Very good. Very good. Yeah, with this charge, weight loss. Yeah, really good, really good. All excellent su suggestions. All the red flag sort of symptoms we're all picking up on, as well as assessing the the history of the lump as well. Okay, so yeah, these are, oh, there we go. So yeah, so these are just some of the things that I mentioned, but of course it's not an exhaustive list. So for the lump, just to take a thorough history of the lump, Socrates were used for pain, I'm sure you've been taught. Um, you can also remodel this and just apply it to the lump as well. So the site of the lump, when she first noticed it, what's the character of the lump? What's the texture like? Um, you know, associated symptoms with the lump, has it been progressing, has it been getting larger? All of these things are very important when we're profiling if, if this is a malignant process or if this is more of a benign pathology. Uh, and then, yeah, lots of these symptoms you mentioned. So red flag symptoms, and then as well, things specific to, to the breast, so redness, ulcering, dimpling. Um, is the patient febrile? Is this an infective position? Um, will there be access to the slides? Yeah, I'll try and send them out to you guys. Um, and yeah, uh, really impressed as well. You guys mentioned taking a fo focus ops and gynae history. We'll come on to talk about that a little bit later, so I won't spoil that. And a family history, which a lot of you guys mentioned as well. And then also, I think at the end, if you have time, um, you know, drugs, alcohol, smoking, we know that smoking is a, is a risk factor for breast cancer. Um, but of course, I think this, the focus of your history should be on, on the lump and then screening for, for concerning symptoms. Okay, so what we look for examination. So we've um, we've done the history now. Um, what features are you going to do when you take a look at the breast? If you could pop them into the chat again. Yeah, really good. How firm is the lump? Is it mobile? Is it tethered? Yeah. The size, the shape, the symmetry, yeah, definitely. Palpate the auxiliary roads, yep. As well as palpating all four of the quadrants, it's always remember always remember to, to continue to palpate into the auxilia. Yeah, packing the skin. Discharge, is it bloody? Check for the lumps, yeah, absolutely. Sure, yeah, so I'll share some of the some of the ideas I had. So yeah, another thing is perhaps that she had some, some previous uh, breast surgery before. Um, abnormality is very, very valid. I think important to remember that breast probably, you know, are unlikely to be, uh, I, you know, symmetrical. So some degree of asymmetry is normal. We're, you know, normal human beings. But I think if one breast, say, looks particularly engorged or erythematous, uh, inflamed, or, or perhaps there's a, a, a visible lump, uh, often, you know, lumps aren't visible, but perhaps it, perhaps the, the, the lump is visible, then I think that would be more cause for concern. Masses, um, if there's a significant mass that's visible, inver inversion discharge we talked about, um, and then we've got scaling, erythema, puckering. Uh, per Dorange, I'll, I'll show you the next next slide. Attempt to express the nipple, nipple, very, very good. 
Sure. So some of these are these are some of the, the signs that we talked about. So if we look on the top left, that's perduron, just basically like the skin on the breast is look looks akin to an orange sort of skin, if that makes sense, like of the of the fruit. Um, it's not a common sign. It's uh, I understand to be associated with um, inflammatory breast cancer, which itself is a rare form of breast cancer. Um, but I thought worth noting it, it's uh, interesting enough. Um, on the the middle, we can see an erythematous breast. You can sort of make out the breast um, on the contralateral side, um, and you can see it looks quite different. Um, we can see some nipple inversion on the on the top right. On the bottom left, you can see a lump just outside the areola. And then on the bottom right, um, uh, hopefully you can see some uh, eczema, ex eczema changes uh, on the nipple. Does anyone know what that could be? Yeah, it's Padgett's, yeah. Um, the point I'm just trying to make is that the eczema is starting right in the center of the nipple. Um, so I think to put to simplify it crudely, what I've I've learned is that you know eczema starting on the on the center of the nipple, expanding outwards is more likely to be Paget's as opposed to some eczema changes of the breast. Okay, yeah. So um, I've got my uh, feedback slide here, so you can complete complete this now. We can complete it at the end. Um, but yeah, you'll get a certificate of attendance, um, which you can keep for your portfolios or your bits and bobs um, once you complete the feedback. I won't go on for it too much. We can uh, give you a chance to do it at the end. Okay, we're back into another SBA. I'll just start the poll for you. So a 57-year-old female has been diagnosed with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. She's to be started in adjuvant therapy. Which of the following would be most appropriate? Leah, that's a, a good question. Um, we'll discuss it after. So yeah, you got you guys did um, very well. A little bit of split, but um, for the most part, we we got there. So I can I'll just scratch off number one for you. It's a red herring. It's an antifungal agent. Um, nothing to do with breast cancer. Um, the crux of the question really came down to the fact that this woman um, needed uh, either number two um or tamoxifen which is a serum so letrozole is an aromatase inhibitor uh, as one of you guys carefully pointed out um is this woman menopausal or not uh therapy changes significantly post menopause as opposed to peri or pre menopausal women so pre or perimenopausal women are still producing endogenous estrogen from their ovaries menopausal women stop being able to do this. Um, so their mechanism of, of, of providing estrogen for their body is through aromatizing androgens. Androgens are either produced by the ovary still um, or by the adrenal glands. Unfortunately, I didn't tell you if this lady was strictly menopausal, which was just to try and make it a little bit more complicated. Um, 
What I was hoping you'd go for is that this lady is 57. Mean age of menopause is is, is around 50 years old. Um, more than likely, this lady is menopausal. It's probably, she'd be an outlier if she was uh, still pre-menopausal. Um, and from that, I was hoping you'd go for letrozole. Um, just to add some more challenge to it. But yeah, tamoxifen is a serum. So in pre- or perimenopausal women, we just we use tamoxifen. I think this diagram is really nice because it just shows how um, uh, the drug uh, acts on um, estrogen receptors and modulate them. Um, Trastuzumab, uh, which we'll talk about a little, little bit later, is a biologic drug. Uh, and then um, we've also got a chemotherapy agent at the bottom in doxorubicin. Okay, so this slide is really important. I think if there's one to take a sort of screen grab of, or even just have a look at uh, on the website itself, uh, or in the in the guide, it's this. When you're, I think, setting an SBA question or a MCQ, being able to to work around your knowledge of uh, a guideline is probably one of the easiest ones you could set. Um, so having an in and out knowledge of this is is, and particularly the top part. Um, when we talk about consideration of referrals it makes it a little bit more challenging to set an appropriate question but being able to set a question on a patient over the age of 30 having an unexplained breast lump is very easy uh, and and probably very likely the other things to note are over 50 year olds um, only require discharge retraction or other changes of concern in one nipple so there's quite a low threshold to referral um, I would say, but yeah, definitely know this in and out, this top portion here. Okay, so which of the following is not associated with increased risk of breast cancer? Okay, yeah, so we've got a split between between two. And the correct answer is BMI less than 18.5. So just to run through it, we've got a couple common themes. One is is of um, increased hormone, hormonal exposure. So both um, progesterone only pill and pre precocious puberty um, are both in there because of the increased hormonal burden that are associated with them. Progesterone only pill, you're giving yourself ex exogenous progesterone. Uh, and then with precocious puberty, you've got more cycles, uh, more menstrual cycles uh, in your lifetime. So you're increasing that total lifetime dosage um, of your endogenous hormones. Nulliparity, um, similarly, is in there for increased hormonal, hormonal exposure because of the fact that you've got fewer menstrual cycles, so you've got a break from that um, regime of, of, of surge endogenous hormones. Um, and interestingly, there's quite a lot of research that shows that um, early pregnancy, so having specifically having a, a child young, actually causes a permanent um, decreased risk of breast cancer uh, that's lifelong. Um, and there's a lot of different postulated sort of cell to cell mechanisms for this and i think there's descriptions of, of potential gene modification and uh, decreased proliferation of progenitor cells um, in the mammary epithelium um so it seems like there's probably more to it than just um uh, hormonal dosage um but i think it's an area that's uh, that's still quite um developing in, in research and i don't think there's there's a thorough understanding as of yet but there's a strong association in the literature. 
Um, the other is BRCA1 mutation, which I'm sure you're familiar with, is, is the most significantly associated mutation with, with breast cancer. Others, of course, being BRCA2 and uh, some others that might crop up a little bit later. And yeah, so BMI less than 18.5, which makes someone, um, clinically speaking, underweight. Um, obesity is an associated risk factor for breast cancer. So we've got a 63-year-old woman. She started on Herceptin following the diagnosis of HER2 breast cancer. Which of the following side effects is the most important for her to be counseled on? I'll just pop the poll up for you. Okay, so we've got a little bit of a split. So the correct answer is cardiomyopathy. So the two um, known side effects that are included here, teratogenicity and cardiomyopathy. Um, VT risk I put in as a red herring. There's there's no associated risk that I'm aware of in the in the literature. Uh, it's actually used, Herceptin or, or uh, trastuzumab, uh, which is it's also called. Uh, is used to treat gastric cancer and esophageal cancer as well. Um, so I, I, I didn't remember them actually but when I was uh, writing these slides. Actually, it came to came back to me once I was um, to writing them up. The two that are known, obviously, are teratogenicity and cardiomyopathy. And of the two, um, the woman is most likely past childbearing age. I don't want to say it definitively because I think I saw a case of a 62-year-old lady giving birth recently. But by and large, she's... she's um, past childbearing age. Uh, so probably most significant to her would be cardiomyopathy. But yeah, both of those two answers are uh, significant risks. Okay, I'll just put this one up. So this one, yeah, the, the answer to, to this one, it's quite a messy flow chart. Um, that they have. And I think it's one where you kind of just have to sit down and get familiar with it because it can get quite confusing. It's more of a rote learning type of thing as opposed to um, understanding. But I think you can simplify it down by just uh, having an awareness of some key principles. Okay, we've got a nice split across the board in this one. Nobody's going for the one that's very wrong though, which is which is the important thing. Okay, sure, let's discuss it. So, for which of the following would genetic testing be least indicated? And again, I think it's quite a mean question for me because I've said um, least indicated, so I'm asking you to, to, to flip the answers on their head. Um, the caveat here is, is actually having a mother, so your, you know, your first degree relative, um, 
diagnosed with breast cancer less than 40 uh, warrants genetic testing. Um, so it's, it's really just being pernickety and, and, and uh, writing the question around the rule. Um, the TP53 gene is one of um, the significantly associated mutations uh, alongside BRCA1, BRCA2 we've discussed and um, a host of others. Male breast cancer is um, alarming, it's very uncommon, 99% of cases of breast cancer are women. Um, so it's one of the criteria that actually um, uh, does warrant referral to secondary care. Um, four, we've got her aunt being diagnosed with breast cancer, so a secondary secondary relative, and then her sister being di diagnosed with ovarian cancer, so a first degree relative. And due to um, common uh, genetic risk factors, um, that would qualify. Uh, as well as mother and grandmother both being diagnosed with breast cancer, so first and second degree relative with breast cancer. So here are some snippets from um, NICE. Essentially, what did he say? Not to identify. The difference between three and five is that in three, it's just his mother that has breast cancer, so one first degree relative and that's over the age of 40. In five, he's got both a first degree and a second degree relative. Um, if I show you the summary of the guidance here, it will kind of, um, it hopefully will make it a bit clearer. These are not, uh, it, again, it's not really about understanding, it's purely rote learning, uh, the different criteria and what warrants genetic testing. But um, for a first degree female relative to be diagnosed with breast cancer, uh, the age cutoff is 40 years uh, that we have. Again, I imagine in real life, in real practice, how much this is adhered to, I probably would vary. Um, but in terms of writing an SBA and writing a question, um, I think it'd probably be fair game to, to be that specific. Yes, yeah. Option five is any age. I'll include the link for this again at the end so you guys can take a look. It's probably one you just need to go over and digest. But things like male breast cancer, bilateral breast cancer, concurrent ovarian cancer, and of course things like a personal history of, of breast cancer all, sh all should raise alarm if you're in doubt and, and can't quite remember these. Okay, so I'll pop this one up. nearly getting there now. Yeah, everyone who's answered this has, has got this uh, got this all wrapped up. I'll let a couple, couple more of you answer and we'll go through it. But yeah. Since you've all got this right, does anyone want to just pop in what you think the vignette was alluding to? Um, as a diagnosis. Or we can just, we can just get through it. So what I was trying to get at here was fat necrosis um, of the breast. So fat necrosis is uh, a condition, it's a benign condition um, that presents really what could be quite similar to, to you know, a malignant lesion. You could have a firm, irregular lump, um, painless, um, 
and it could be quite concerning for, for a patient to discover it. I think the key thing to, to know is fat necrosis is associated with obesity. So I'm trying to paint a picture this. This patient has got a metabolic syndrome. Um, and then the other the factor is that it can be atraumatic, but it's often associated with minor trauma. Um, so those are the two things I was getting at. She's a, a lady with a previous history of metabolic syndrome. Um, and then you notice her ankle is, is booted up, really. So she's had, an, she's had a tumble. Although this is a benign condition, um, it's transient. There's often, you know, not um, any management that's that's undertaken. It's often just managed conservatively. Um, although if, if it is problematic, um, I think uh, intervention can be can be pursued. Um, it still does require a referral to a breast breast clinic because you can't clinically rule out um, something like an you know inflammatory breast cancer or whatever it might be. Um, so because of the concern um, for any irregular lump, uh, you need to still consider and rule out malignancy appropriately. Okay, yeah, so just to touch through onto benign breast disease, we've got your final question for today. Hopefully this is a nice easy one. Awesome, yeah, everyone got it. So yeah, this is this is staph aureus. Um, so lactation mastitis is an important one to know about, probably the inf important effective condition to know about. I think just understanding the mechanism probably helps it make sense. So um, the lactational ducts get blocked and then these get engorged with the backflow of blood, blood, sorry, milk. Um, you get inflammation of these ducts and then this, you know, engorged blocked duct gets infected. Uh, and then this can lead to an abscess if you're if you're, if you're unlucky. Um, the mainstay really is initially just simple analgesia. And if the lady is breastfeeding, um, it's important to note, you know, mastitis isn't just lactational, but often can be lactational. It's encouraging, encouraging uh, you know, milk expression, um, trying to unblock those ducts. Uh, and um, hopefully that will alleviate the symptoms. Um, of course, if symptoms persist, so you know, 12 to 24 hours after continued effective milk removal, um, then you can provide antibiotics. Equally, say if you've had a milk culture and you know, 24 hours, 48 hours for that culture to be processed has elapsed, and it, the culture comes back positive, antibiotics are also warranted. And then finally, a fissure, which is just you know, like a slit that you might see in the, in the nipple complex. If a fissure is present, again, antibiotics are also warranted. Um, Empirical treatments with flucloxacillin, but if the patient's panallergic, then um, erythromycin or clarithromycin it could be used, and that's for a 10 to 14 day course. Um, of course, if you have cultures, then you can also have sensitivities, and if the sensitivities are, are is suggested differently, then of course follow those. But the presentation, I think, is, is relatively straightforward. It's a, a fluctuant lump, uh, it's tender, the breasts will be erythematous, you know, as you can see on the right side of the screen, and the patient often can be febrile. Um, and as you rightly said, Staph aureus is the most likely causative organism. But worth noting that all of these organisms listed uh, are known and documented to cause um, uh, lactational mastitis. Oh yeah, and of, of course worth mentioning, if the patient is septic, so you know, they're, they're scoring on their QSOVA score, you're concerned about them, they're unstable, uh, then they need to be sent urgently to hospital. And then a quick summary of, of benign breast disease, almost like a sort of cheat sheet, just for key phrases and things. Um, some of the key things to know about are fibroadenomas, fibrocystic disease, ductectasia, and interruptal papilloma. Um, so fibroadenoma is uh, the, the highly mobile, you know, discrete breast lump that uh, a young woman might present with. Um, very common in, in women sort of aged 18 to 25, and really you're, you're gonna see them in women under 30. 
they develop from the lobule itself in the breast from the from the picture we talked about earlier um and actually these these can be managed conservatively if they're small there is a small concern um if they're if they're larger or say that they're growing that this could be something called phyllodes tumor this is a very rare um breast uh breast tumor um and i think it's 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 probably not worth diving too deeply into um but it's worth knowing about fibrocystic disease of the breast this is really applicable to all women of, of, of menstruating age so premenopausal women uh, and this has changes to the breast that happen uh, concurrently to the, to the hormonal cycle um, it's crudely probably described as, as bilaterally lumpy breasts and women have a breast pain and this really reaches a, a peak one week prior to menstruation Treatment for this is largely supportive, again, so, you know, use of a supportive bra, um, offering analgesia. Uh, most of this actually re resolves with menopause. Um, and I think there's an emerging and potential role for, for use of uh, hormonal therapy in the form of a contraceptive pill. Duct lactasia, conversely then, now we're talking about menopausal women. Um, with menopause, these ladies get uh, shortening and dilatation of the, the uh, lactis lactiferous ducts. Uh, and these can then become clogged. Uh, smoking predisposes these ladies to this condition. Um, and what you can character characteristically see is discharge, uh, which can even turn sort of a greenish color. Again, there's no really specific treatment, but like we mentioned before, uh, discharge in a lady um, over the age of 50 can be concerning uh, from, a, from a red flag perspective. So the two week wait rules do apply again here um, and it's still be worth getting checked out in the one stop clinic. Um, and then la lastly is uh, the interruptal papilloma. So this is a, a benign tumor of the, of the ducts again, usually 40 to 50 year old ladies uh, and you get singular duct discharge. So rather than discharge, you know, coming from the, the nipple at various points, it, if you, uh, if you ever see a picture of it, obviously in real life, it will literally just be coming from, from one, from one duct. Um, and this can be clear or it could even be blood stained as well. Um, and if problematic, this is uh, just treated with removal of that duct itself called a, a microductectomy. So yes, yeah, so to summarize, we talked about, you know, the, the two week wait criteria for breast cancer, uh, what happens at the triple assessment. We talked about features to look for in an examination history of a breast when pre presented with a lump and then operative, non operative treatment for breast cancer, uh, as well as some features of benign breast disease. These are some of the resources. What I'm just going to do is pop them into the chat. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with them, I would highly recommend Macmillan's Rapid Referral Guide. This is the segment on genetic. Management for, for, for breast cancer, family history of breast cancer. Um, and Geeky Medics, I'm sure you're familiar with as well, but I definitely recommend uh, those two resources. And yeah, just a little bit from me on my, on my references. Perfect. Thank you so much, guys. That is my talk. We're just past eight. Um, so yeah, hopefully right on time for you guys. Um, next up, we've got ENT in a couple of days. If you'd like to, to scan the feedback form, um, and yeah, once again, when you complete that, you'll get a certificate for your portfolios. And I'll, I'll pop it into the chat as well. You're very welcome. Thank you for, yeah, thank you all for joining. I hope you have a nice rest of the evening. Thank you guys. Yeah, I'll end the call here. Good night, everyone.